when Suzanne asked me to uh, do this meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, normally what I do with meetings, I mean, whether it's here or in Africa or wherever, is always seek the Lord and say, okay, well, what do we have a piece about? What, Where is the Lord leading in this? Um, what's the subject matter? What do we, what we need to do? Because it's always my heart and my intent to at least get up here, uh, wherever he happens to be, and do something that is in God, not just my clients getting up and prattling on with what seemed like a reasonably good idea at the time, but was never a God idea. So I, I begin to seek the Lord about this afternoon and um, what to do and what to present and uh, kept kind of looking at it even up until last night and to a degree a little bit this morning. I don't particularly want to preach per se um, and don't feel to do it, rather more to kick around a few ideas, a few thoughts, ask a few questions. Um, the questions I, I'm going to ask, I don't necessarily want an answer this afternoon. Uh, the questions are more uh, designed for you to have a bit of introspection and thought yourself um, and how they may affect you and what, if anything, you feel you want to do about them uh, at some later point. Having said that, if anyone wants to uh, have some input or answer the questions, by all means, by all means, go for it. So, yeah, we'll we'll have a probably a, a reasonably casual approach this afternoon rather than a sort of a formal preaching style meeting. If you've got a Bible uh, open to Matthew chapter nine, verse nine, it's Matthew nine verse nine. So, welcome to uh, everyone on uh, Zoom, and uh, of course, everyone here as well. So, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, the King James says this, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. It's the calling of Matthew. If we consider Matthew for a moment, the guy is a tax collector, a pretty despised member of society, uh, not exactly a shining bright messenger of the goodness and the integrity of society at the time. What's even worse is that Matthew was working for the Romans. He wasn't even working uh, or doing something on or behalf of the Jews. So he was despised as a tax collector. He was despised socially because he was working for the occupiers. And uh, tax collectors at that time were not exactly noted for their honesty and integrity. So we've got a guy here that Jesus has just called to ministry, and he's hardly what you would expect. He's a despised tax collector working for an occupying army and is a hated member of society. So if you're looking at him, you think, and there's a guy that's got a great future in God, and there's the guy that's, I can just see the anointing oozing out of him. I'm definite call to God, definite uh, call of God there. But here's the thing. God calls you on the basis of your future potential not your present circumstances. Let me say that again. God calls you on the basis of your future potential, not your present circumstances. The problem that we run into is that we tend to look at the present circumstances. And so God is saying, you know, I'm calling you, and God has got this plan, this picture, this enormous future potential to break out in your life and we tend to look at the circumstances and go well yeah we do a Gideon yeah well you know if God's really calling me why well, I've got all these problems and uh, I'm sort of leased in the father's house and quite frankly uh, we've got no resources and 
this whole set of circumstances that look I, I can't sorry you know I can't really respond in a positive way so there's sort of a conflict usually between God's perspective and our perspective uh, personal experience um, God called me out of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 10 about 30 years ago um, I sort of looked at it and thought well that's pretty impressive I haven't got a clue what it means um, if somebody would have told me at the time that I would um, be ministering in 12 or 14 different nations, most of them more than one time, uh, doing some outreach crusades, conferences and you know, whatever else, um, I would have called that person an idiot. And uh, I had no concept, no idea, would have thought the person saying it was off with the fairies and uh, because I was basically had no resources, was totally insecure, uh, had no experience, and as far as I was concerned, had very little ability as well. So, you know, I, I was about the least likely. But while Matthew is called, and he's hardly what you would look at and say, man, if ever there was a guy who had a call of God on his life, it's got to be this tax collector over here. I don't think so. But here's the reality. Every single one of you, every single one of you, and every believer has a call of God on their life. Now, it may not necessarily be a five-fold ascension year for ministry. I mean, for the most part, uh, it's not. But there is a call and a purpose of God in your life. There is a destiny in the kingdom for you to fulfill. There is a special and unique niche in the kingdom that only you can fill because you are a unique, uniquely created person in God for such a time as this. And the destiny and the purpose that God has ordained for you, only you can fill it. So we each have a, a purpose. The, the issue, of course, this then says, well, how do I identify that? How do I recognize it? How do I follow it, do something with it? I would suggest you start by saying, what are you good at? You know, if you, do you, everyone has some sort of gifts or ability uh, in their life. What are you good at? Because God has put talents in your life, and the only difference between a talent and an anointed gift is when you put the talent on the author. So everyone has a talent. You know, people can be great singers, guitar players, drum players, or whatever the case may be. But it's not at that point an anointed gift. So another person, in other words, a person who has a good voice and is gifted in the world as far as their singing ability is concerned, they then get saved. Then they put that voice on the altar. And when the talent is put on the altar, it comes back as an anointed gift. But start with what are you good at? What sort of talent have you got that nobody else has got? What talents do you have in your life? The next question might be, what do you have a passion for? I mean, what kind of, what either really annoys you or what do you really love doing? Do you have a passion for something? And like Matthew, don't worry too much about your present circumstances because God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And say that again. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So you may look at your present circumstances and say, in my present circumstances, I haven't got a clue I haven't got the resources. I don't think I've got the ability. And I really just don't know. 
that's a great place to start. I'm sure if somebody would have come along to uh, Matthew the day before Jesus and told him, hey, listen, pal, here's what's going to happen to you tomorrow, and and more to the point, here's what's going to happen to you over the next you know, 10 or 15 years, Matthew would have gone, get out of here, you idiot. And and sometimes I know I know you know years ago I felt the same way. But Barbie used to say to me sometimes that we need to do thus and so, and and to her credit, she was really discerning something in the future. But at the time, and I'm going back in you know, 18, 20 years ago. At the time, I was pretty much just locked into what are the current circumstances? Well, based on the circumstances we have in front of us now, we can't do this. But you can. Matthew just got up out of the tax office and walked off with Jesus. I mean, that's what it says there. Look at it in verse 9 there. Jesus said, follow him. He just got up and followed didn't argue about it, didn't debate about it, didn't didn't do the Gideon and say, well, you know, why have we got all these problems and, you know, we haven't got any resources and, you know, he's, oh, okay, follow him. So what about you? What, what gifting have you got? What talents do you have? What can you use? What passion do you have? What what kind of cranks you up a bit? What what annoys you, or alternately, what really what you really enjoy doing? In other words, if you weren't locked into your present daily circumstances, if you could do anything in God tomorrow, what would you be doing? If you weren't controlled by the mortgage, the the job, the whatever the case may be, and I'm not advocating people go out and quit their jobs or whatever the case, you know, but I, I am at least posing a sincere question and saying if you weren't controlled by job, mortgage, you know, all the issues of life that sort of keep us uh, under the pump, if it wasn't for that and you could do anything you wanted in God tomorrow morning, what would you be doing? And that'll that'll give you a little bit of insight. How do you find these things out? Well, have you asked? Sometimes it's that simple. Lord, what do you want me to do? And, and you, you can extend it a bit. I mean, some years ago now, there was a guy who said, oh, look, I, I feel I'd like to teach. I'd like to teach the word. I said, okay, that's great. Teach who? Teach what? When? Where? There's a big difference between, you know, teaching RE in a school on the Gold Coast or, or teaching in a conference in South America or teaching in a village in Africa. It's all teaching. But teach, teach who? What? Where? When? Ask the questions. If God has a purpose and a destiny for you, and he does, and you say, hey, Lord, I'm personally interested and desiring to fulfill my purpose and call in you, show me what it is. Help me identify what it is. Help me identify the next step. He will answer. You know, God is not a fool that he, he says, oh, like, I want, I, I'm calling you to this, but I'm going to keep it a secret. It's a secret locked up in heaven. Ask, seek, and you shall find. Psalm 30, 139, verse 5 Um basically says he has gone into your future to prepare the way. He has gone behind you to protect you from the harm of the past. And he la has laid or is laying your hand, his hand upon you to bless you here and now. 
So God is not limited by our concept of time and space. But Psalm 139, verse 5. So he goes into the future to prepare the way. He goes behind you to protect you from harm. And he lays his hand upon you to bless you here and now. So here's my question again. If he's gone into your future to prepare the way, prepare what? Have you ever asked him what he's preparing? And if he is preparing the way, might you need to have some understanding of that so that you can engage in some sort of self-preparation? Because this is my experience. I've found that God is using me in ministry in ways that I watched my father when I was 8 or 10 or 12 years old. Let me explain to you what I mean. My mother and father uh, worked right out in southwest Queensland, about 600-odd miles west of Brisbane. And they were on sheep stations there. Mum was a station cook. Dad was usually a manager on, on a station there. And most of the station, you know, contrary to the uh, Wild West Cowboy movies where they, they seem to have about 40 people driving 100 head of cattle, um, out there, and I'm talking about the 1950s and 60s, typically, um, you know, there was literally just me and mum and dad uh, on the property. O occasionally there might be one other guy. But, I mean, contrary to the, you know, the American Westerns where they got, you know, 40 cowboys driving 100 head of cattle, uh, that, that was not the case out there then. So I grew up as a kid, uh, had no siblings, just me, so it was just me, mum and dad, on a sheep station 40 or 50 miles from the nearest town. Now, back then, of course, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no yellow pages, well, there might have been, but I never saw one. So you're 50 miles from the nearest town. If a pipe bursts, you know, you don't get on the phone and start looking through the yellow pages looking for a plumber. Um, guess what? That day, you're the plumber. If a flood came through and washed half a mile of fence out, uh, for the next week, you were the fencing contractor. When it came to shearing time and you needed to muster, you know, 3,000 head of sheep, you were the stockman. So whatever needed to be done on the day, that's what you were. So it was no good saying, well, I'm a stockman, but um, I can't fix a pipe. Or, you know, I'm reasonably handy at plumbing, uh, but don't ask me to put a fence post in or do the fencing. So you sort of had to be a jack of all trades, a bit of a master of none, but, you know, you, you could do anything. So I grew up watching my father do pretty much whatever needed to be done on the day. And by the grace of God, I find now that in ministry, um, in Africa or wherever that happens to be, um, that's what I do. Uh, you know, some days I'm an evangelist, some days I'm a pastor, some days I'm a teacher, um, you just do whatever needs to be done on the day. I'm sure many of you, many of you have found uh, the same sort of experience. But whatever it is that you've grown up watching, whatever you're good at, whatever your current talents and abilities are, whatever your passion is, it will be in those areas that your real call and destiny and purpose of God uh, has its has its roots, so to speak. He's gone into the future to prepare the way. What is it? Ask. Because you have a destiny and purpose. What is it, Lord? What is it, Father, that you are preparing? And what is my role? And how do I need to prepare? On a kind of a shorter example, um, when Gwyn and I go to Africa, a couple of months beforehand, 
Uh, I'm sure the Lord is already in Africa preparing the way and, and doing stuff. But a couple of months beforehand, I'm sort of saying, okay, uh, when we get off the plane there, I mean, what do I need to do? What do I need to preach? What's going to happen or whatever? So there's an element there that he's already gone ahead to prepare the way, but there is a responsibility for me to prepare so that when we get off the plane, then we're all on the same page doing doing whatever needs to be done to fulfill the purpose and the calling. So it, it's kind of, might I suggest or submit to you, we can look at these scriptures and say he's gone ahead to prepare the way. But if you've never asked what it is, how can you prepare? And if you can't prepare, when you get there, how are you going to flow in unity and the commonality of purpose? Does that make, make a bit of sense? And, and all of this really is, well, it's mostly just about asking. There, there are suddenly moments, I think we've all experienced them, um, Moses had his suddenly moment with a burning bush. You know, up until that point, I mean, here's another guy that you'd look at and go, absolute call of God on that bloke's life. I mean, hang on. He's a runaway fugitive from Egyptian justice. He's a murderer and he's run away as a fugitive from Egyptian justice and he's hiding in the badlands of Midian looking after a few sheep. But <laughs> here, there's the national leader for sure. But it, but he has the burning bush experience. He has his suddenly. Gideon, despite all his insecurity, doubts, fears, and whatever, had a suddenly and became a national deliverer. Matthew here in the in the tax office, he's a despised, ill-equipped corrupt, hated character and has a suddenly. We all, if we position ourselves spiritually saying, yes, Lord, here am I, then we all open ourselves to a suddenly. Let, let me give you an example right here at home. Gwyn. Now, about two years ago, or some, somewhere about two years ago, give or take a couple of months or whatever, we were having the meetings over in, um, uh, back over at uh, Palmer's. I kind of knew Gwyn to say good day to a church. We, we got on fairly well, we weren't that close, but, you know, we got on well and said good day to each other. And and Suzette had asked me to, to, um, do something with the men's group. And I, in turn, in thinking and praying about it, had, had felt to ask Gwyn to come on board and be part of that. Somewhere I forget exactly how the conversation went, but Gwyn and Muriel were sitting at a table that day, and after church I went to them and I mentioned um, the, the men's group, and I'm... 99.9% .9 sure I also mentioned the possibility of Africa. Gwyn kind of tentatively put his hand up, yep, yeah, pick me, pick me. Um, but, but you know, it, it was like a bit of a blip on the radar, but, but a long way short of reality. A few months later, Gwyn is getting off a plane in Nairobi. That moment, although it may seem a little bit incidental, that moment at that table was a suddenly. Neither of us, I think, probably thought of it in that context at the time, but it was. And as it turned out, Gwyn had written a, an English, um, English uh, literacy course, I think Muriel, about 14 years or something before that, so about 14 years before that table encounter, pick me, pick me, Gwyn had written an English literacy course, which the Lord told him was for Africa. 
But 14 years had dragged by. He still had written the course faithfully, had produced it, had still never been to Africa, or I think at that time much looked like going to Africa. Then he has a suddenly. Hey, might go to Africa next year. Are you interested in coming? Ten months later, Gwyn's getting off a plane in Nairobi and did a fantastic job, the best. I, I've travelled with a few um, armour bearers. Gwyn sort of weaved around for a few days until he found his slot and then became and still is the best armour bearer I've ever travelled with. But more to the point, um, because Gwyn may do another trip with me or however it works out, and, I mean, that's great, but now Gwyn is in a position that he came to Africa last year and, and okay, you know, he's finding his feet and new experience and so on. Then he came back to Africa this year but spent um, two or two and a bit of the three weeks he was there doing his agricultural training. Subsequent to that, he said he, he got a couple of people saved, which was uh, the first time he'd done that because his role and his purpose this time was to really focus on the agriculture because in Uganda they need revival spiritually, but they need it uh, in farming and ag agriculture as well. So Gwyn is there because he has a talent and a gift and a passion in agriculture. So again, I say to everyone here, What's your gift? What do you have a passion for? What what can you do? Because for Gwyn, he just slotted in as a spiritual armour bearer and as a great guy to work with and travel with. But his passion was agriculture. So now God has taken that talent and now taken it halfway around the world to use it to bless people who desperately need it in another country. Now, as an extension of that, and over the next few months, I'll work with him uh, in basic evangelism so that when we go back next year, he can now do the agriculture. He's an extremely competent armour bearer. He can pray, and he'll be a, a competent evangelist. So the result of that is... Gwyn could then get on a plane and go anywhere in his own ministry. And to me, I think I think that's brilliant. Because you know, I, I don't I don't want people to sort of just follow me around for the next 10 years. I mean, to me, if you can come for a couple of years uh, and then step off into your own ministry and your own thing, praise God and hallelujah for it. But again, it comes back to what's your passion? What would you like to do? If tomorrow morning you weren't bound by mortgages and, you know, whatever else it is that sort of pretty much rules life at the moment, where would you be and what would you be doing? Because there is a destiny and a purpose in God for everyone. You know, he hasn't created anyone to just leave you parked on the side of the road somewhere. There's a word that God has really impressed upon me in this in this last probably week or 10 days. If you turn over to Matthew 14, um, verse 29, we've got verse 29, and he said, come. So th this is a story of, and say in the previous verse, verse 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And then Peter uh, was come down from the ship and walked on the water to go to Jesus. I reckon that would have been a life-changing experience. I don't imagine, I mean, regardless of Peter's denial and other issues and whatever, from the moment that boy stepped out of the boat and walked on the water, I don't think life would have ever been the same. And bearing in mind the other 11 smartest people of the day stayed in the boat. 
the fishermen, who of all people knew that you can't walk on water, get a grip, wake up for yourself, dummy. He's out walking on the water while the other 11 smartest disciples of the day say, no, fuck, come on, seriously, uh, we'll stay in the boat. Thank you very much. The word that the Lord has impressed upon me in the last week or 10 days is the word expectation. Mm -hmm. Now, Peter placed an expectation upon himself based upon the word from Jesus come. So Peter has now said, okay, Jesus said come based upon the word of the Lord. He has placed an expectation upon himself to respond and do something. So if we come back to the questions, what are you guys expecting? I mean, do you get up Monday morning with any expectation? Let, let me put my hand up and say guilty as charged, Your Honour. Um, I've gone years with no great expectation. You know, I've, I've just been a Christian believer, a Christian minister, whatever. Uh, you know, I read the Bible, I pray, I go to church on Sunday and I get up Monday morning and go to work and, you know, do do whatever comes along or whatever needs to be doing. But I'm not walking around with any great expectation. But if God, and we know he has, so it's not a matter of if, but he has, if he has gone into your future to prepare the way, what expectation are you placing on that? Are you trying to find out what it is and are you placing the weight of faith and expectation on that future? Because cities and nations are changed by activity. I mean, now, for intercessors, that activity might be prayer, uh, for other people, it might be getting on a plane and going somewhere or whatever the case. But but whether it's in the workplace or whether it's in ministry or whatever, things are changed by activity. Yeah, that's why it's called the book of acts. It's not called the book of thoughts. It's not called the book of good ideas. It's not called the book of suggestions. It's called the book of of acts it's what was done it was what was done by the early church under the direction of the holy spirit that changed the world what was done so yeah we we look at it and say okay what what can we do moses gideon and matthew gwyn and others have had their their suddenlies Matthew 14, Peter has placed the weight of expectation upon the word of God to produce a miracle. Do you at any time place the weight of expectation upon the word of God in your life to produce a miracle? Seriously, when we read it, and most of us probably in some way or another in, in family, in life, in ministry, in, in work and whatever, probably have need of a miracle or two. But are we pay, placing the weight of expectation upon our faith to produce that miracle? I'm sure when Peter got out of that boat, he expected to walk on water. I mean, he didn't get out on the, out of the boat expecting to sink, regardless of what happened later. And he saw the, you know, the waves and the storm, and Jesus had to lift him out. But there was an expectancy. Turn over to um, 
Acts chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Now this is the, this is the lame guy at the gate, get beautiful. So Acts 3, 4 and 5. Peter, fasting eyes upon him with John, said, look at us. He gave heed to them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Arise and walk. What was it that was different about Peter and John? This guy is a beggar. And beggars place themselves in an area where there is significant foot traffic because statistically, if there is a lot of people walking past, there are a better chance of, of getting a few coins or, or, get, or getting something. I mean, a beggar is not going to intentionally say, well, I know what I'll do. I'm being the genius that I am. I'll sit around the corner where only one person goes past every three hours. So there's a lot of foot traffic here. There's a lot of people going up and down. What was different about Peter and John? Peter said, look, look at us. Give us your attention. Okay. And, and he's looked at them expecting something. He, he got a lot more than what he was expecting. But what is it that produces expectation? Whether it's Peter or whether it's John, whether it's uh, Peter on the water or Peter and John here. Might I submit this? We can believe something or we can have faith in it. Here's the difference. You can believe something and believe it to be true, but as much as you might believe it to be true, you're not necessarily going to take action or do anything about it. But genuine faith will usually command some sort of response. So in other words, belief can be quite passive. Faith is generally fairly proactive. You know, it, it commands a response. Peter got out of the boat. This guy here is looking at them expecting to receive something. So in other words, genuine faith produces an expectation, uh, whereas belief can be sort of uh, fairly passive. But what, what was different about them? I, 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 I mean, it doesn't specifically say so, but I, I think there was a sense, a sense of, of something. There was, when he looked at them, there was something different about them. Maybe the way they carried themse in themselves, maybe the anointing that was upon them, um, even though the lame guy probably wouldn't have recognised it for what it is, but he sensed there was something different about these guys. They were carrying something. And, of course, they said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we're going to give you is completely different. So in other words, they're saying, you know, and, and when you see Peter and John together in that situation, they are also prophetic, a prophetic symbol of the church. So the lame guy outside the front door is symbolic of the crippled city outside the front door of every church and every nation on the planet. And Peter and John represent the church. They represent the church that needs to speak to the crippled city outside the front door of every church and every city on the planet. And, and, and what the church needs to do is to say, we're not coming with programs. We're not coming with good ideas. We're not, we, we are, finally, we are coming with the anointing and the authority and the power of God. And that's what's going to make a difference. See, the, the, the lame guy represents the crippled city outside the front door of the church. Now, the lame guy looked at Peter and John 
expecting to receive something. We can have a situation where Peter is getting out of the boat and he's putting the weight of expectation upon himself, upon his own faith and his response to the word come. This one goes the other way. The lame guy is looking, as it were, at the church, expecting to receive something. When the world and the city looks at the church today, what are they expecting? Not much, I would suggest. Because by and large, from my experience, you might disagree, but by and large, from my personal experience, the world out there doesn't have a particularly high opinion of the church and does not uh, hold it in particularly high regard or expect anything much at all from it. In fact, it sees it as a fairly impotent, uh, irrelevant uh, religious organisation. That's possibly, among other things, because I think over the last you know two or three hundred years, whatever the case may be, I haven't been around quite that long almost, but um, the church has slipped into this pastoral teaching role. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We need good pastors and we need good teachers, so I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. But when the church, generally speaking, and I'm not talking about here or any specific church, I'm just speaking in general terms, when the church slips into this pastoral teaching mode, it's a very passive mode. It's where we sort of, we get looked after pastorally by the shepherd and we come to church and we get taught and all of those things are good. I'm not knocking it. But it's a very passive mode to be in. It's not the prophetic apostolic church that was there in the beginning of the book of Acts. And we know that it is activity that produces change. So there is a great need to say, okay, what's my passion? What's my talent? You know, if God's preparing the way, what is, what is it he's preparing? What, what do I need to do? What do I need to contribute? Uh, how, how do I step into this destiny and purpose? What sort of expectation do I have on it? Because I, I would suggest that if the world is looking at the church, it's probably not at the moment, generally speaking, expecting to receive much. And all things being equal, in many respects, I would suggest, and it might be those that disagree with me and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I would suggest in many respects the church is not giving much. Relative to what we see there. Because if we, if we go with what we see in book, the book of Acts, it's a dynamic miracle power, miracle operating, prophetic apostolic church. I'm, I'm sure if miracles were to break out in the church tomorrow, genuine, uh, authentic, confirmable miracles, you'd potentially have people lined up down the road to get in. But because by and large it's a pastoral teaching church um, with not too much happening, uh, it's a pretty short line for the most part. You know, different things in different ways. So you may may agree, disagree, whatever. We we have a, an identity in Christ. I think sometimes, and this has made a difference for me, particularly in the last twelve months. I, I've become probably more aware and conscious of my identity and position in Christ and in the kingdom in the last 12 months or so than the previous 30 years. When, you know, I think I pretty shared this when he came back from Uganda, um, just near the end of the trip, um, I was praying to I start a meeting, it was really more of a Bible study than anything, as I prayed to, start the meeting, there was a girl over on the side just fell out of a chair. 
and I was <laughs> I got sucker punched, but I, I was tired. It was near the end of the trip. I was worn out, and I wasn't on my guard. I should have been, but I finished opening the meeting in prayer and went, "What the heck's going on over there?" And I just walked over, uh, looked down. She's on the floor. She's looking up at me. I use the term look in the loosest possible sense. Her eyes are rolled back in her head. Um, all you can see is white. There is no pupil. There's no nothing. There is just two completely white eyes looking at me. Um, she, Her head rolled over on the side and this black inky fluid came out of her mouth. And just at that moment... Um, this quite powerful demon had a smack at me. Um, but when you're in a situation like that, and thank God for it, you kind of need to know your identity in Christ. It really helps to know who you are and what your position is in the kingdom. Uh, otherwise, moments like that can get kind of scary. But in John 3, chapter 3 of, of John's gospel, Jesus says you must... Not it's a good suggestion or a good idea, or you must, you must be born again. You can't see or enter the kingdom if you're not born again. If we go back to Genesis, we know in chapter 5 of Genesis, Adam has a son called Seth. And it says in chapter 5 of Genesis, I think it's verse 2, that, verse 2 or 3, that Seth is born in the image and the likeness of Adam. But Adam by that time has fallen. So Seth is no longer in the image and the likeness of God. Seth is in the image and the likeness of fallen Adam. So the reason we must be born again is because we are all descended from that bloodline of Seth we are all descended from a sin-contaminated bloodline and there is a need that we must be born again so that our spiritual DNA can be changed and we're now a new creation, a new creature from a completely different bloodline. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that you are a new creature. So, so here's your, your ID. When you are born again, you are a new creature. All things become new. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that he who knew no sin became sin, that you might become the righteousness of God. So you're born again. You become a brand new creation in the image and the righteousness of God. Here's a couple of couple that, of scriptures that just really kind of, I mean, I believe them and accept them totally, but they are just so, to me, so profound in their application. It's astonishing. There's one in Romans and one in, Corinthians, let, let me give them to you so you can write them down. Romans 4, 8, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. What both of them say, Romans says, blessed is the man whose sin is not imputed. And the Corinthian ones talks about God who is reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sin. Here is the astonishing thing. We are human. We are flesh and blood people. We are capable of sinning. But your sin is not imputed to you. It is not counted against you because it has already been paid for on the cross. There is no law of double indemnity. In other words, God doesn't put the sin on Jesus then you stuff up in the middle of next Wednesday afternoon sometime and he says, uh, uh, it's against you as well. There is no law of double indemnity. The sin has been imputed to Jesus. 
It is not a situation where somehow Wednesday morning you are the righteousness of God, but then you stuff up mid-afternoon Wednesday and, well, now you're a little bit tainted. But it's not quite the righteousness of God because you blew it there about 2.30 Wednesday afternoon when somebody cut you off in the traffic. So you are born again. You are a brand new creature. You are the righteousness and the image of God fully restored and your sin is not imputed or counted against you because it has already been counted against Jesus. Then it goes on in Romans 8, 17, so 16, 17, to confirm that you are a child of God, you are a joint heir of Jesus, and an heir of God. So when you're born again, um, it becomes quite staggering. I mean, you are a brand new creature. You are the righteousness of God. Your sin is not imputed to you. And you are adopted into the family of God. That's your identity. What about your position? Because with identity comes a position. Ephesians 2 6 says that you are seated together with him in heavenly places. Ephesians 2 19 says that you are a citizen of the kingdom and a member of God's own household. And 1 John 4 17 says that as Jesus is, so are you in this world. Not as he was. I mean, that would be pretty good as well. But not as he was, but as Jesus is now in glory, so are you here now today on the Gold Coast. So you new create, new, I want to ask, I'm going to ask another question here. You take home and think about it. You are a new creation. You are the righteousness of God. Your sin is not imputed. You are a son of God and a joint heir with Jesus and an heir of God. You are seated with Jesus in heavenly places. You are a kingdom citizen and a member of God's own household. And as Jesus presently is, so are you here today in Rabina. What are you expecting from all of that? Seriously. What weight of expectation are you placing upon that identity and that position, if any? I, I, I don't ask these questions by way of you know, criticism or whatever, but I'm just saying, you know, are, are we like Peter getting out of the boat or the guy at the gate beautiful? Is our faith, are we operating more on a passive belief or are we operating out of a faith that places the weight of expectation upon our position and identity? Imagine, if you would, for a moment, Somebody unsaved. Bad limp. I mean, this person's in fairly bad shape. They can see you as the word of God describes you. You look in the mirror, you see Shane. Shane for all his foibles, faults, whatever, as we all have. Shane who is working through the issues of life and whatever, as we all do. That's what you see in the mirror. But the guy from the world who has got a bad limp, feeling really crook and not in good shape, 
he goes up and goes, wow, I can see what you are. I can see the glory on you. I can see who you are. I can see what you are. What sort of expectation might that person have? Yet we get up and look in the mirror and go, oh, well, Monday morning again, I'll go and put the kettle on and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> I do anyway. I, I know most of you guys wouldn't do that, <laughs> but I, I do. Yeah, I get up now. My God, who is that? <laughs> who are you and what have you done with my body? And, and then stagger out to the kitchen and make a cup of coffee. But but sometimes I, I sit and go, okay, should we have a greater expectation? If we believe who we are, if we believe our identity and believe our position and believe what that word says about us, what expectation are we placing upon that? Because I would imagine if somebody from the world staggered up and could see you as you really are, boy, their level of expectation would be a bit different. There'd be a few wows coming out. So I only wonder sometimes when the angelic beings and, and others look at the church, and again, I'm not talking about any individual church or people or whatever in general terms. Yeah. How is it that you're not changing the world? How is it that the city is going to hell in a handbasket when, when this tells you plainly who you are and what you are? I mean, different people have different calls and purposes. I mean, some might get on a plane and go somewhere, some may stay at home and pray, some may whatever. Uh, it's up to the individual to say, okay, Lord, well, what is it preparing? What do I need to prepare? And how do we go about this together? So sort of make a bit of sense. Let's let's get this finished. Turn over quickly to uh, Messiah uh, chapter 60. Messiah chapter 60, uh, verse 1 and 2 says this. Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory... Hold on to that word. Glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall, shall rise up upon thee and his glory, his glory shall be seen upon you. Hang on to that thought, thought and turn over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 20, 23. Jesus is praying, and he says in verse 20, Neither do I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on you through their word. Verse 20, Jesus is praying about you. That prayer is for every individual from the original disciples through until the current generation, because we have believed progressively through the centuries because of their word. That they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world will believe that you have sent me. Now, the world is going to believe that Jesus was sent, not because of the great preaching, not because of too much else, but because of the unity and the love in the church. It's no wonder that the devil works so hard to cause division and conflict and so on. And the glory, we just saw in Isaiah 60, the glory that will be upon them. And the glory, verse 22, which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. 
I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent, have sent me and has loved them as you loved me. It is the intent and purpose of God that every individual fills their own destiny and purpose because every individual has a destiny and purpose in the kingdom. It's the intent and purpose of God that the church should work in unity and his glory is seen upon the church. Because when the church is working in unity and love and the glory is seen upon the church and people are working out their individual destinies within that framework, then the church will truly have something to offer the city the crippled city down the road. But in the meantime, we might have to ask ourselves a few questions and consider a few things that might need to be changed. And changing the world, as it sometimes said, is said starts with, with changing the individual. I saw something this morning um, And we'll finish with this and then, then we'll pray for Israel, which really touched me. And this guy is actually a Christian minister, Gregory Dicker, who I watch periodically on, on segments on Facebook. But he's saying, in, in his opinion, Michelangelo was next to God himself about the greatest artist of all time. And he's referring to the statue of David, which is Michelangelo's probably most famous sculpture, and it's in a museum in Florence. And, and it's a magnificent statue of David. Now that came apparently from Michelangelo was at a marble quarry, and there was a big piece of marble over there that all other sculptures ha sculptors had rejected. They considered it to be worthless, useless, and unusable. Just over there, pretty much on the scrap heap. A worthless, useless, unusable lump of marble in the opinion of other sculptors who themselves were no amateurs. Michelangelo said, that's the piece I'll have. So the magnificence of the statue of David came out of something that had been completely rejected and thrown aside. Because somehow... Michelangelo was able to envision and to see the magnificence of David inside that lump of rejected marble. As the artist, he, he could see, he could envision what could be produced out of that cast aside, rejected, worthless lump of marble. And God looks at you sometimes in all our doubts, fears, foibles, insecurities and uncertainties that would have us rejected and cast aside by most of the world. But he, the ultimate artist, looks at us and says, but I see something magnificent within that and I will chip away at it and I will polish it and I will touch this and I will until the magnificence that I have envisaged is on display because God does not call you out of your present circumstances he calls you out of your future potential so whatever your circumstances are at the moment, whatever limits or limitation you feel that you've 
you know, God holding you back. All I can say is don't. Allow God to produce the David within you. Does that make sense?